Um, my friends started getting the fish. Uh, we all started listening to it, and uh, a bunch of my friends, about three of them, got really into it, and I really didn't. I didn't really enjoy the music pretty much at all. But uh, when they got into it, they really got into it. Um, the kind of music that it was really wasn't exciting for me, and I just never really enjoyed it. I'd say about two of them were pretty much obsessed. Uh, they go to all the concerts, and you know, um, uh, when we were riding in the car, I was listening to his fish and on the radio, and <clears throat> buy fish shirts and all this bumper stickers to put on the car. And yeah, they're pretty uh, obsessed with them, I'd say. You can't expect these people to, you know, latch on to something that other people love. You know, this is their love, and it, it's hard to share that with people that don't understand. There's something in the air that makes them addictive like crack. This summer we're hitting about 13. I'm going to 10 shows this summer. So that'll be my 94th show. I think actually, I think I have my whole life is, I owe my whole life to fish just because I wouldn't be the way I am and I wouldn't have met so many great people and know so much great stuff. People will be like, dude, I had to miss my grandfather's funeral for Camden, <laughs> man. It was rough. Like, because you got to have priorities, you know. The Clifford Ball, I went. I called my mom, wished her happy birthday from the ball. But, but, the last, but the last two years, yeah, I felt guilty. And... I don't think I could do an entire tour. For the people who are out there every single day doing the whole tour and uh, for tickets every night, I don't really... I don't, I don't really know exactly what's, what their driving motivation is. Personally, sometimes I have a hard time understanding it. A month of 15 concerts and nobody telling you where you're supposed to be or what you're supposed to be doing. Sounds like a pretty good gig to me. Uh, oftentimes it seems like I'm bringing people who, uh, you know, who are fans but aren't like huge fans, wouldn't really make the effort to go to the show on their own. Because they're playing music and a lot of people we know are here. And I'm looking forward to New York, the Oswego would be the shit. This is going to be the best fucking month of all time. July 4th is going to be the butternuts. I want to hear some lizards or some wicked paw groove. I'm excited. I've been getting ready for months. I thought it was cool that they are going to be playing mainly, you know, in the East because fish is, you know, traditionally in, in the East Coast band, you know, they formed here, their roots are from here, there's certain musical styles such as the jam band certainly, you know, is a 90s East Coast phenomenon. And uh, I don't know, it's going to be good to uh, stay around home, stay around the old good old East Coast college fish tradition. The scene and sort of where the band comes from, I think, is very much East Coast. I definitely enjoy the fact that Fish is certainly an East Coast type of band. There's a significant amount of difference in, uh, in mileage between the first and second show. It's from Kansas to Nashville, Kansas City to Nashville. And uh, you know, it's quite a hike, you know, if you're coming from certain parts of the Midwest or out West, certainly, you know, it's kind of on the way, so why not? But if you're from, you know, like around New York or whatever in the East, it really doesn't make any sense. So a lot of people on tour are skipping the first show and just starting off in Nashville. We rough it, you know, we, we're camping, you know most of the time and uh, we don't always have showers and you know it's the middle of July we're down south things don't always go as planned and there's always all sorts of complication like we had our idea of what the tour would be like and they had theirs and I guess like when, once we got going like it just wasn't working out we both sort of had the same mindset and the same mental process and the other two guys are just yeah. different so I mean we, we I don't know they're more into like, you know, getting to the lot as soon as possible and like just doing lot stuff and like going to the street. Instead store. of experiencing everything else. And we're, we're sort of also that... interested in like seeing stuff along the way. And the, and the problem is that it's his car, so he makes the decisions. Right. Which is really like sucking up our... You know, which, yeah, which ends up the car is a power tool. And... Both of us would be better off if we were separated. Being so much more native than most of the people for the next three days. We're not taking We're not. a shower for the next three days. Yeah. No shower. Stuck at a rest stop after driving for a while. We're going to get a hotel tonight, dry some of our shit off, clean ourselves up. It was Fish's first 4th of July gig ever. and You know, fireworks are down south. You know, it's all about fireworks. So, what up?
Since you last saw us, uh, we've worked our stuff out, and what's, what's going to end up happening is on the 5th, Dan and I are uh, hopping on a plane to uh, Philadelphia where we're getting another car um, back down to Charlotte. And, and, uh, not missing any shows. Not going to miss any shows, and yeah. do the rest And it'll be together. fine. Atlanta was cool because even though it was a really tough ticket, it wasn't that big of a deal because there's this one spot where you could just, you know, hear the music almost as if you were in the show from outside the show and you could see the crowd and people were dancing and having a good time and it was, it was awesome. Absolutely insane, the best show I've ever seen. I think they're going to do it every year. And fireworks in the blood. Hey, this is great. There's definitely one of the better shows I've seen. I had a group in time and ripped out some funk for me. It was very good. Yeah. Set up the big one. Heads up! Four! <laughs> <laughs> Leaning on the barrier that separates the 20,000 fans and the four band members and being in front of everybody else, there's nothing that can actually ever top that theory. Ever in the whole life? No. Maybe if we had $1,000 worth of fireworks, we lit off 100 and lit up the sky, but 1000 oh man, it was TNA. TNA, baby. Straight up TNA. It's kind of bullshit. Isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's fucking great. I went, I went tour has been really nice. Not having to drive all the way out west. Shows very close to each other. And especially at Great Woods, um, I felt it. Um, you can feel that the crowd was old and Fish responded with, you know, that four play a long time. They knew what was going on. And, uh, you know, you hadn't seen a crowd go that crazy in a while, like I felt. So, yeah, I think the Northeast is certainly special to them. I have um, many different. Um, many different types of people in the fish culture. I teach high school, I've been doing it for about five years. Uh, I teach 10th graders European history and government and have a really good time doing it and just happy that I get these few months off to uh, enjoy a little bit of summer tour every year. I go to school at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. I've chosen to um, study um, anthropology and history and um, philosophy and how it relates to music. We're from Chicago. Chicago? I, yeah, I go to Columbia College. My 21st birthday and my 21st show is in Deer Creek. My career, man. I do web uh, interface design consulting. Um, work for a big corporate company. It's beautiful and they so cute. Fish is in my fur. I got a dress for Fourth of July with all fishes on. Oh, I'm a bio major. I'm a forensic scientist. I work for the Department of Energy. I work at the Vermont Housing Finance Agency in their multifamily department. Basically, we do affordable housing. I teach in Portland, Oregon. You know, they're middle school kids and they definitely have a sense of curiosity about the scene. They're very curious as to what it's about. And um, I'd really like to see some of them at the Portland Meadow shows this fall, actually. <laughs> maybe a few <field. laughs> Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I work at the Peace and Justice Center in Burlington. Uh, I do community organizing. I practice law at Smith, Sovic, Kendrick, and Sugnet, which is a firm here in Syracuse. Uh, half of my practice is music and entertainment and sports law, mostly focused on music. And the other half is medical malpractice. I work with a lot of the young, hot, upcoming jam bands. Um, I, worked with uh, several of the ones that have just been signed to major labels. Uh, some of them are your traditional jam bands, some of them have a little bit more of a flavor uh, in the jazz area. And uh, then I teach Music Law 1 and Music Law 2 at Syracuse. There, there are plenty of uh, young people in our class and people in the industry that are also fans of fish. 
Uh, and so if I make allusions to rock and roll acts that they can identify with, first, it's going to catch their attention. And second of all, just the absurdity of finding some of their favorite people in difficult situations on exam questions, or at least parodies thereof, uh, makes them that much more excited to enter into a really difficult concept, such as a copyright concept, or a really in-depth contractual battle. A great question arose today about suppose somebody uh, were to take a popular song like 2001 and do their own version of it. And what we discussed actually in class, it had to do with whether or not that would be a derivative work. We got into a long discussion about whether or not that particular version that Fish does constitutes sufficient originality and materiality to be a derivative work, or whether it is just them doing their own version of somebody else's song and isn't a derivative work. So we, we basically, we came on over from Israel. We all learned in yeshiva there. And we came on over to like provide a Jewish scene for fish, for fish concerts. Because there's so many Jews here. So we figured, why not come by and, uh, and do like Jewish stuff on fish lot. Because of the Holy Sabbath today. Yeah, that's right. And uh, you know, this is like a very, very like spiritual weekend. And the ancient language of Hebrew is quite spiritual, so it all ties together with the weekend and like the whole vibe that's going on over here. Welcome to the Fish Concert. This is the after the concert interview with Fish Heads. My name's Ike Live, and I'm a deadhead and a war rat. I'm a drug-free deadhead. Uh, I no longer use drugs or alcohol. The fellowship spelled P H. E-L-L-O-W-S-H-I-P is an organization of drug-free fish heads. But we make no statement against drugs. We like to party just as much as the next guy. We just support each other in our effort to stay clean and sober at fish concerts. And it's a pleasure to share this with you all. Come join us where the yellow balloons are anytime you'd like. Thank you. The Fellowship is a group of fish heads who are clean and sober, fish fans of all sizes, shapes, and ages that, for one reason or another, decide to go to the shows completely straight, no drugs or alcohol. If I don't get into America where I'm going to Teen State College in New Hampshire, if you do anything from living in a nat national park, like maintaining the nature trails, to, uh, to living in the ghetto and helping kids learn how to speak English. You also have um, vendors. You gotta put money back into the scene, you know what I'm saying? Like, in terms of people just pulling off the American dream, I guess, which is like to be able to sell a product and make a buck. It's capitalism at its best right here. It's on uh, fresh fruit kebabs here. They're two bucks a piece or uh, two for three dollars. Also got some ice cold sodas and water. Cheese, cheese, pasta, beer, water. Massages, <laughs> hot, whatever you want. There you go. Enjoy the show. Thank you, you too. What? Fuck, yeah. Gotta have one. Fishman Gordon or Tom Oh, wait a minute. I'll have to get Trey. Last year we made, uh, I think, I think we made, how much did we make? 350 a show. About 350 bucks a show. It's just so peaceful, you know, there's like, what, there's like 70,000 people here, 100,000 people, and yet 
like everyone is so friendly and you know everyone is just just meeting new people there's like no violence at all going on it's just everyone having a great weekend partying totally peacefully and I'm proud to be a part of it. This is my friend Stephanie here. Hi. And uh, just the other night we were talking about how like, I don't know, how you go on, you know, how we couldn't wait to go on tour just because people are nice, you know, like like the meaning of the word nice, you know, like you just like go on and you're like kind to other people and like you look out for one another and it's like a community. Uh, people are just a lot nicer and care for each other and don't really uh, care for people that, uh, you know, we, we don't care that everyone's different. You've got people here who are very open to a lot of experiences, and that's one of the reasons why they come to fish shows and want to meet all these people, is because they're so open. I wish the greater society was more like a fish society in a lot of ways. Spanish Muji City Campground here in Laverne, Tennessee, on the outskirts of Nashville. And uh, I hadn't heard a thing about this group called Fish until about three weeks ago when we began getting telephone calls from people who wanted to stay here for this concert. It seemed to me to have an interesting philosophy of life. So we haven't had any complaints and we have a lot of people who stay here on a monthly basis who are retired people and so forth and we haven't had any complaints from them. These folks were here all night last night and uh, I just have had nothing nothing but good feelings about the whole thing and I'm really really very well impressed with it. And it is in many ways like a like a microcosm of society. There's dirty people and there's clean people and there's kids that go to college who are going to, there are people that are traveling from far and there are people that are coming from there. Tweebies, dickheads, they all think he's a righteous tool. We're all kind of in this together and uh, I don't know, you know, we all kind of have similar beliefs about like the way things should be. It's a whole world in itself. What you see here is a, is a, 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 a tribe of people that travel around the country that wear their own clothes, speak their own language, do their own thing. And there seems to be a, a type of style of dress that goes along with the fish scene. There seems to be uh, different types of attitudes. I mean, there's a different way to look at people, but it really still is a, a microcosm of society. I mean, we all, you know, there's cliques and cool people and people who think you're not cool enough if you don't look like them. I mean, we may look different, but but there's still the same, it's the same way that society breaks down. There's that same breakdown here in the fish lot as well. It, it looks like a fashion show here. You also have um, the college um, frat boys. You Just singles out people, I think. If some, some people aren't wearing that, like patch corduroy or dreadlocks in their hair, they feel sort of out of place. You go to enough concerts and there's always some asshole that sits behind you. And so last year in Worcester, um, there was three. We sat like right in front of the one of the bar boxes, the corporate box, and there was these three guys, and they got way drunk. And you know, first the guy spills his food on the chair, and then he like falls down in the chair behind me, and finally, like right in the middle of the second set, almost when we thought they were so drunk that he had left, he just like tosses his beer all over down my back, rolling down my legs, and it's just like. This really sucks. Here, yeah, if you look at Clifford Ball or Lemon Wheel, I wasn't at the West, but either year, there's like this little urban world forms in the parking lot, and you can see there's a there's a ghetto in the lot. I mean, I remember walking out of the set in Lemon Wheel, and there's like the nice area <laughs> where people have the nice tents, and there's a central vending zone, just like a you know a, a central business district in any city. And then there's, there's like in the periphery, I went, I remember walking and just seeing like wasted ass drunk people just like s sitting like beside their cars, passed out on the pavement. <laughs> like the further you get out from the, you know, the central fish business zone of the lot, the, the vendors all go, go near where the dance parties in the lot form. It's just the way people congregate seems to be just like any other economic system. Fish lot is the extremes of positive and negative. The scene's changing quite rapidly. Um, just a lot of people that don't come for the music, they just come to like sell drugs or they come just because it's like a raging party and they can get all fucked up and do whatever. Is this, is this that kid's face turns to me and he's like, because we could hear fish from where we're standing, but only barely. And I think I actually said like, what is that? Because I couldn't, I couldn't hear what they were playing. And he's like, I fucking hate fish, man. Like that, and it's like, it's a bull. Like, he had nothing to do with fish at all. He was just there for, like, being, being a fucking mover and a shaker while the show was going on. I, I think Toronto really pointed out to me last night um, 
one of the negatives of, of kind of being on tour and being around the scene is that Toronto, we noticed there were a lot less drugs around and there were a lot less people selling drugs. And we feel, you know, our theory is that no one wanted to cross the border with what they had. I mean, we don't carry anything in our cars, so we didn't have any worries. We were just going for the music. But I think a, a, a negative is that a lot of people are on tour with drugs to sell drugs and really could care less if they go into the show. And it bothers me because, I, you know, it's about the music for me. We got, we got messed with at the border into Canada. Got stripped. <laughs> Really? They found, yeah. They found rolling papers on the seat of our car. But the guy knew we didn't have anything. He just probably just wanted to yeah. fuck with us. I see a lot of really good stuff here. I see a lot of people that have run away from lies. People that see that that American Babylon system is a lie and are running away from that. And then the problem is that there's not so many people running towards truth, I feel. You know, people are running towards a good time. Instead of, instead of running towards, uh, you know, law school or business school, they're running for the good time. Which can be good, you know, like the only way to get through, to reach God is through joy, I believe that. But uh, there's also has to be a certain amount of consciousness involved, and I think sometimes we forget that. Tensions build, and um, things go bad, people get arrested, um, a lot of people don't re show respect to each other. It, it just turns out bad sometimes. But overall, especially this year, it's been fairly good. I mean, there's always like a few like people that don't do good things for everybody, but you know, you're going to find that with any group of large people. I don't think the intelligence exists everywhere. I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of irresponsibility within this, within this community. Um, there are a lot of people that, that really that just don't respect, don't respect what, kind of what they have and the opportunity they have to enjoy music like this, to enjoy a scene like this. You know, people littering, people not cleaning up after themselves. Uh, a lot, I see a lot of dogs, you know, going around by themselves without their owners, without food, and... Uh, you read the stuff that you're supposed to read before you come here, and it says, don't park your car in the camping area, don't bring your dog, no nitrous. No nitrous. And you just look, to, you can take your camera around and find a thousand examples within... There's a car. Yeah, there's a car, you know, within walking distance, well, within easy walking distance. <laughs> of people just ignoring the rules. And you know, some rules are, are, are bad rules, okay, fine. But some rules, like, you know, be polite and don't talk about the last show you saw while they're playing the show right then, you know, <laughs> next to the people. You know, you, you, you have to tell people, you know, could you be quiet? There are some musicians on stage and they're playing something I'd like to hear. Yep. She took all the change, so that's what heroin is. We got duct tape and plastic bags. We gotta do something about the fucking free air conditioning I just received. They take my tapes to fucking junkies. What? I said it was fucking junkies. It took like a change. Fucking took your penny. Took all the change. Give me a fucking baseball bat and show me that fucking kid's face. Me too. Oh, oh my fucking god. There's that element of people who are not open to new things, and I see a lot of intolerance on the lot. Yeah. They're talking about I so get a lot shit. of drugs. Ooh, 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 ooh. Good for you, you fucking jackass. <laughs> It's a lot of people that do that. They throw the fish out of the dining like fish. I don't know. They just do a lot of drugs and walk around. I think most people should be banned for Those are like the runaways and shit, though, you know? Yeah. Those are the people that have They should be branded with like a fish trademark or something. Fish lot loses. Hello. <laughs> 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 the whole going to shows without tickets is, is the wrong thing to do. Um, I mean, inevitably, I mean, people don't think that they have an impact, you know, by going to a show without a ticket. They don't think they impact the, the scene at all. But I mean, when all those people add up, I mean, you just have extra extra people, meaning more traffic to get to shows, meaning, meaning uh, the venues have to get more security. And indirectly, it really drives up ticket prices um, and, and decreases the chance that Fish is going to get asked back to a particular venue. You just can't play some of these smaller venues anymore when you've got 30,000 people coming every single night. You know, the town of Morrison uh, just can't support 20,000 people that can't get into the gig like a big city like, say, in New York City could. Uh, even some of the other towns, such as Albany, I'm surprised that, uh, you know, that there haven't been 
more difficulties. But as you recall, even in 1994 in Glens Falls, there were some uh, there were some difficulties, you know, with with the fans that didn't get into the show, which is unfortunate. But you know, that also is uh, you know nothing's changed in that respect since 1975 when the Who were playing in Cincinnati. Nevertheless, there are still plenty of people out there willing to give the good vibe, willing to uh, you know lend a hand willing to do their part and try to combat all of that. And Fish has done a phenomenal job with their green crew, uh, trying to keep the scene clean, whereas, you know, that was always a problem. There was that great mantra on Dead Tour, leave nothing but footprints. Um, Fish is making sure that they do that, giving back to the community in so many different ways. And it's refreshing to see a band that has both the financial wherewithal to do that and the desire. It, it, it really needs... Um it needs to get back to the music. Now. Like, I mean, it, it, it's cool to do whatever, but it needs to stay a little straighter. First and foremost, for me, when I come to a show and with Fish, it's all about the music. Just kind of a mix of the, you know, the jazzy African influences and the, the reggae too, with kind of Zeppelin, Springsteen, American rock and roll. Like Trey, he kind of has that superhero quality to him kind of the, the leader of all things, the man of the hour rock star quality. And there, there are few men that match Trey in such regard, and John Bon Jovi is clearly such an American hallmark of history. Do you think that Fish could ever create a rock masterpiece that would be on the same level as Living on a Prayer? I think they have, but I would like to see them play Living on a Prayer. All four members of the band were geeks in high school, and I think that's the answer right there. It's that higher, upper-level intelligence to put more thought into it, more energy into it, I definitely. Fish is a very um, interpretive band. I think that you can interpret their lyrics almost any way you want. And, um, you know, for one person, you know, might, you know, some people think that they're silly, uh, but I think that they're, you know, very self-interpretive. One person might take the lyrics, run like an antelope out of control and make, you know, might mean one thing to them, another person might hear it and it might mean something completely different to them and that's, I think, how they've really affected me and, you know, you can just really interpret them however you want. There's no direct message, I don't think, in a lot of their lyrics and songs. Something's going on in my life and I turn on fish, the words kind of relate to what's going on, it's kind of magical. Chalk does torture, can I live while I'm young? See, I like waste. I think the first time I heard that I started crying. You never know what you're going to get on any given night at any show, because no two shows are the same. And that's what I think has made the scene so prosperous and what has you know, helped guide it through, is that people continue to go to shows and see bands repeatedly because every show is a different experience, whether it be musically or personally or on, on any level. They've set the tone and set the stage for all the bands that have come up and become large in you know, the last few years or so. Um, yeah, obviously, the influence is that they, their music is jam music. You know, they obviously they cover lots of different forms of it. They, you know, with the bluegrass and uh, with the jazz and with the funk and you know all the different types of music they touch on. A lot of the jam bands out there kind of take one one form of that and run with it. Like if you look at uh, if you look at the disco business for disco biscuits, for example, they're extremely unique and their music is great. And what they do is they you know they've taken the techno, it's more of a techno approach to the jam music. So they create these free form improvisational jams with the underlying feel of you know techno rave kind of feel and I think it's I think it's great what they do I think they're just so unique and a lot of the bands like the Disco Biscuits that I think have a good chance of thriving and ha have thrived in this scene are ones that take kind of what has been set before them the precedent of jam music set before them to a different level rock and roll is in here and it's in here <laughs> yeah. It's been going excellent. I've been having a lot of fun. I've been going backstage and meeting like I had a talk with John Fishman last night. That was a lot of fun. He's a really nice guy. What did you guys talk about? We were talking about relationships and uh, what we want out of relationships and pretty much a heart-to-heart -heart talk. It was a lot of fun. He's a nice guy. Any good advice or tips or did you say anything wacky that you might remember just off the top of your head? Uh, anything wacky? Um, <laughs> I don't want to say that on here, I don't think. <laughs> you know, years ago, the band was always out talking to the audience. Um, so it was a little different. I think that it's kind of hard for them and overwhelming. You know, Mike gets in his golf cart and drives around. And if he stops for a second, he kind of, you know, it, it's overwhelming. I can understand why he would just want to keep driving. Um, so, you know, they're at this stage now where I'm not really sure what they can do to keep it 
personal with the audience. It's got to be difficult. And, you know, they find these ways and that's, you know, the, a uh, way to connect with people, but with a large amount of people. So you have to do something like the meat stick, which is similar to the Macarena, but it's something that, you know, everyone can do. It's time for the meat stick. Gary, eat the meat stick. Take out the meat stick. Time. Whoa, shocks my brain. Whoa, shocks my brain. It's incredible to see how they've evolved musically. Um, with the change in the setup this summer, and Mike being in the middle and Fishman being in the middle, you can really see how their music has changed, especially in the last three years with the funk down in 97 and the changes in 98. It seems like it's all coming together. Their styles have changed a lot over the years. Um, I definitely loved the, uh, like that tension and release type of stuff that they were doing, like 92, 93, 94. Um, there was definitely times that I was kind of down on what they were doing, probably. 1995. 95, 95 and 96. And when, when summer, summer and fall 97 came around, I was kind of like at my wit's end. I was like, if they don't really get good soon, I'm going to stop seeing them on a regular basis. In fall 97, they just blew me away. And I was just like back. And now I'm having, I'm having more fun at these shows than I've had in a long time. The jams were getting too busy for me for a while. Everyone banging away in key, and they're starting to kind of play a little less and fill each other's holes. So you got like Swiss cheese with holes, and you layer it. There's no more holes. I like the new setup too, though. Yeah. Um, I, when I first heard it, I was like, what? But, uh,. I don't know, it's just like fresh. It's, it, they seem, they almost look more cohesive as a group. It's like weird. Um, you know, because they're, they're not just that, there's just that one line. I mean, they can all like, they can all just look around and they're all right there. Um, they're not spread out like they used to be. Uh, they just, they produce a uh, sound that comes, that brings so much emotion and uh, it just feels so good. And they, I mean, it's the best dance music around. And, uh, I don't know, it's rock and roll. It does something to you that can't be explained. Something that you have in your life that you, that's going for you, and when that happens, you feel good about, about life as a whole. Whether that's a girlfriend or money or something of the sort, it instigates me to feel like happy. And I feel happy when I hear Fish. To me, Fish is all about the idea of, of just busting out melodies and grooves and stuff that are spontaneous. You know, there's there's rehearsed pieces in the midst, but you're going to get to that point of, of now, of Zen, that only exists in that exact moment. And for that moment, that's, what's, that what made it, that's what made it worth to me from the very beginning. The first moment I saw them, I know that they were capable of producing that one-of-a-kind moment. They'll start playing a song that I think is just going to be you know, the standard run-through. And they do something in there that absolutely blows my mind. It's, it just feels, it's just a, a great, you know, feel-good feeling, man. I, I just like... I really enjoy music that makes you appreciate the moment. And I think that's what Fish personifies, is the moment. Time is the, is the dimension in which we can most readily come into contact with the divine and with holiness. Every moment is sustained by God, by the infinite. Every moment holds the potential for us to connect the infinite. So moment is not even really, it's not even really uh, defined or circumscribed potentially. Every moment really is infinite and every moment holds the potential for any individual person to connect to the infinite. Everyone, every, the, the purpose of every human being is bound up <clears throat> with connecting to the moment, connecting to his or her moment. And that moment is not just one passing event in time. What that means that every person has his moment <clears throat> means that every person has his or her window to connect with the infinite. There's a holiday that comes once a week, the holiday of Shabbat. That's a holiday which is solely dedicated to celebrating the moment. It's a holiday in which we refrain from dealing with space at all because it's an understanding that, that all of our dealings with space and with all the things that we're trying to achieve during the week, all that stuff is stuff that takes us away from the moment, potentially. It is not a thing that lends significance to the moment. It is the moment that lends significance to things. The very first time I saw him, 
11.27.96, Key Arena, Seattle. End of the first set, and they busted into Axis. And <clears throat> I've been wandering around in front of the soundboard that whole set, and I wound up next to my, to my dad. They busted into Axis, and he leans over to me and tells me, I saw Jimi Hendrix play this song in this building 27 years ago, almost to the day. And he had a tear in his eye. So oh, I uh, went to school in Boston a long time ago, and a friend of mine one night told me I had to see this band. She grabbed me to this bar, The Paradise, and I saw Fish. 1989, I think it was like October, and uh, about 50 people were there, and all I remember doing is staring at Trey with my mouth open at the awe-inspiring guitar work that was going on. It wasn't until later that I started seeing the other members of the band for you know what they were. A lot of deadheadedness going on out in the scene. And it really wasn't quite there. It was smaller, much smaller. Smaller, more intimate. It was a little more like a, even into 92, it was like a, more like a secret club of the Northeast, if you will. You saw a lot of the same people there, and they were a bit more, uh, more individual and strange. It was more weirdness. Yeah. Just people people were... dressing up in strange costumes for no reason, and they still do it, but it, there's a lot more of the uh, hippie uniform now. It's my first fish concert tonight. I have no idea what to expect. I expect a lot of hippies, a lot of smelly people, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. I don't know what to expect. I just can't wait to, to go and have some fun. A lot of my friends are into fish. I've never really got into them. Maybe I will now since I'm going to concert. We'll see what happens. I'm going. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It's going to be your first one? First time. First one. Are you excited? I'm excited. First time camping. I told her not. She has no idea what to expect. No, no idea? Right. No idea what to expect. It was good. It was very good. I liked how you could move from the music. I loved it. I don't know if I do it again, but I love it. Come here. By accident. I sat, if you want to turn the camera, I sat on deep mud <laughs> and put a big dent in it. That's right. <clears throat> Jesus. I feel real, that came out. I feel really bad about that, Jim. <laughs> I do. Well, I thought it was interesting, different, and uh, an experience that I'll never forget. But I thought the crowd was lovely, the, most of the people there were very nice, the band was great, everybody seemed to get along. So I really enjoyed it for my first fish show. I thought it was wonderful. When I listen to Fish, I got really got opened up in a lot of music. I've been listening to a lot of jazz lately. This experience with Fish is like opened my eyes to more music, you know, uh, different bands that are around. There's bands that go along with Fish, like Medeski Martin Wood and uh, Bella Fleck and Selecto. I'm really into a lot of experimental stuff. I guess like that, and then really poppy alternative rock, kind of like Weezer or Ween or something like that. But as far as experimental stuff goes, like. The whole New York crowd of like John Zorn, Bill Frizzell, like Joey Barron, and like any of their side projects is all pretty amazing stuff, you know, in the realm of improvisational stuff. I'm your basic classic rock 70s kid. I'm really into jazz music and into hip hop. I love Miles Davis and Herbie Hancock um, and Jimmy Smith. And in hip hop, I'm a big fan of uh, The Roots and Tribe Called Quest, The Fugees. Uh, I like those some rap, you know. It's it's good, you know. I mean, <laughs> we like to call, you know, in the, in the lot. We like to call it the ghetto, you know. Once you go to the ghetto, you hear the rap and shit, and people are dancing and drinking, so it's a good time. Well, you know, they they're I think they're a pretty decent cover band for sure, and you know, if they pulled something like that out, it'd be definitely a fun thing to see. I've been into progressive rock ever since I was maybe 11 or 12. What I like dates back to things like Pink Floyd, Yes, The Who. Rush and Genesis, where bands were into exploring both musically in terms of the classical aspects of their jams and their lyrics, um, and in terms of their pure talent phase. Now, I also love live music as well. In fact, it seems like the first album I owned of any band was a live one, say, uh, All the World's a Stage, or, oh, Seconds Out, or, well, with The Who, I think I gravitated more towards Quadrophenia than I did, say, Live at Leeds. But frequently, the first albums I got of any band were the live albums because they had the energetic jams. And it was that uh, type of music that first drew me to Fish in 19, say, 88, 89, when I'm listening to songs like Divided Sky, You Enjoy Myself in the Curtain, which have overtones of Yes and Genesis. It's about what we like, you know? If we like the music, if we like the groove, it's not about, like, getting five 
hot girls together, teaching them dance steps to, and try to rage them out until nobody even wants to see their faces anymore. That's why fish has been around for 15 years, and that's why the dead toured for 30. It's because it's real, you know? We don't buy into all that bullshit that they try to sell us. I guess you could interpret this, um, this subculture as um, kind of anti-popular culture, and it, it kind of stems from the counterculture back from the 60s. They're not motivated because of political causes. You know, we don't have the Vietnam War and everything. Popular culture in America, is, personally, I think it's repulsive in some ways. They, they try to give up that, that idea of commercialism. I mean, we have Woodstock happening this year, Peace, Love, and Pepsi, you know? Fish is, um, Fish is a jam band, and mainstream pop um, you know, American culture like to hear radio songs, short three, four minute radio songs, and um, a lot of them, when they hear fish, they get lost in their music and they can't really understand it and what it's all about and the fact that it's all improvisational. And um, some people just, yeah, can't really understand that. A lot of people on the radio just do it for the fame and the money and don't really do it for the love of the music. And I think not only are all farm members of Fish great musicians, but they, you know, they don't want the normal Joe Schmo coming to see their show. They want good people and no one that's going to listen to Z100 all day. I don't know. I just graduated from high school like three weeks ago, and my school only had like 400 kids in it. And like, I'd say all those kids watch Dawson's Creek every night, and like, they, our favorite, I think our senior song was like from NSYNC or something. And those guys don't even write their own music. I don't know. I don't know why anybody would pay 30 bucks to go, go see him in concert. They're just puppets. Puppets for who? The man! <laughs> He's set up to, uh, to send us running around in circles without ever growing, without ever finding out who we really are, without really connecting to our souls, and just to uh, stay quiet for the, so that uh, the people with the money can do what they want to do. All that, all pop culture, all, all pop music is being funded by that. It's being funded by people that, uh, that want, want to keep the people down, that want to keep the people quiet, want to keep the people normal, whatever the hell that means. It's a direct reflection of what's wrong with the mainstream society. Our family values have broken down so much in the past decades. And like uh, this, a lot of kids out here don't have parents that are divorced, are just families that are upset and working all the time because all the parents have to work. And this gives you a sense of belonging, like a family to belong to. And also at the same time, it's a religion. It's something to believe in, something to love, something that moves you. And it's like a spiritual experience being in a show and not being, having no thought and just experience it. There, there's a set of psalms that we say <clears throat> um, when we're bringing in Shabbat. And all of these songs, um, all these songs talk about singing and they talk about dancing. And uh, it's not just an ordinary dancing, but it's the dancing, the mountains are dancing. Dancing is the response that we have um, when, when our, our, our understanding and our appreciation of the incredible goodness and the incredible blessing that's being bestowed upon us in the world at every moment when that, that understanding, that awareness, it can't just be contained in the mind and it can't just be contained in speech. It's too much. It has to come out. It has to come out physically. And so when it has to come out physically, that's when we dance. Music and spirituality really uh, thrive here.
for me, it's just that idea. There's those four guys up there kicking down this groove. That's like one of the few times ever, like in any conscious state I have, where I just kind of zone out everything around me, and it's just th just this tunnel. But then there's other points during the show too, where like they're just pulling out stuff that's so mind blown that I can't even dance at all, and I'm just sitting there just thinking, whoa. I mean, this is four people's amazing creative energy, like, and I can't even figure out what to do or think about it, but I know it's cool. It's like my hobby, almost. Like, going to shows is just my hobby. I'd say it's a combination of traveling and music. There's a lot of people who stand in the pavilion and just gawk at the band, you know, just stand and watch and love to just watch every move that they make. And the light show is a big part of that for them. I'm a huge fan of the lights. Yeah. Very recently in the past, I'd say two years, I really started to notice, stop focusing on just the music and really look at the whole scene. I think Chris has a great deal to do with what goes on with the experience. CK5 is a group that's got together on the internet. It stands for um, Chris Kuroda being, uh, they have, this group of people has officially declared him in their minds as the fifth member of Fish because he's so on top of and in tune with what they're doing on stage. And the lights are just so perfect usually uh, with all the songs that, that it's almost as if he, he's up there with them and knows what's going to happen next. Light. Light is the first thing that was ever created. <clears throat> the creation of light represented the first step in the creation of, of the world as we know it, in the creation of humanity. But light within that account is, is, is so important that it's immediately separated out. It's immediately given because first, when light was created, light was intermingled with the darkness. But immediately God says, no, light has to have an exalted position. It has to be a, have, have a position <clears throat> all unto itself. And it wasn't appropriate that light should be all intermingled with darkness. And so <laughs> one interpretation of the rabbis is that God separated out the light from the darkness. And there was a portion of that light that he saved, that he hid, and that he saved <clears throat> for the righteous people, for only the righteous people to enjoy, just to enjoy, for the, for the pure sake of their enjoyment in the world to come. Every week, every Friday night, we bring in Shabbat with light. And the ultimate form of physical enjoyment that's understood, that's encoded all throughout the Jewish tradition is, is the enjoyment of light. Everybody flocks to this one place to see these four guys stand on stage, and it's just like, it's just, it, music is God, you know? <laughs> it's all about God. It's all just about find something to, to throw your hands up about, you know? It's, uh, it's something emotional because music has the ability to uh, make one temporarily forget about their problems, which I think has a strong connection to this scene because it seems like a lot of people here are definitely trying to forget about a lot. It's a feeling that once you attain, you can't really can't get it anywhere else. It's, it's different for everyone. It's different for everyone. I like meditation we've been saying. Because you um, it's like mindlessness. You just listen to the music and you forget about what you're talking about or what you're thinking about and you just try and listen to the music and dance to it and you just like unconsciousness and you just float and freedom. It's just freedom. It's like traveling. Freedom is traveling, traveling is freedom. So I really firmly believe that there's an energy exchange between the band and the audience. I mean, you can, if you're up front, you can see that they're looking out into the crowd and you can see that they are feeding off of all of us as we are feeding off of all of them. I was in a car accident in 94, uh, about three months. I graduated from high school in June and had my accident in September. I was on my way to see my brother. He's at a, at a football game. Me and some friends were going. Um, pulled, I mean, we ran right. Head on to the car. I ended up uh, 
breaking my neck at the C4, C4, 5 level, which means that probably as you can see, uh, I can use my arms a little bit, shrug my shoulders, uh, but I can't use my hands or anything below that. But then uh, friends introduced me to some albums and went to my first show in 96 in Hampton. And it, that, that's all she wrote right there. Just the people that are around me, I mean, just them talking to me just made me feel good. Because sometimes when you go out, I'm in my chair and I'm going through the mall or going some places, people kind of, you know, give you an eye, give you a certain look like, like, kind of like they feel sorry for you look. But uh, when, I, when, I, when I went to the first concert, it just, uh, everybody, I mean, it, they just made me feel so comfortable. Yeah, I felt like I was part of every part of it all. That's why I love being on the lot, meeting people and just finding out all this stuff. And I mean, even if only 5% of, 5 of it sits in after this whole trip, I mean, I'm going to take away a lot from it. That's 5% of a lot of, a lot of experiences and a lot of people. Well, I love going out and finding out where people are from and what their train of thought is and how that train of thought differs from where I'm from and trying to figure out if, if that, if the reasoning behind their train of thought is from their family, where they grew up, their friends, their peers, their pressures, whatever. But it's, it's always interesting to me to meet different people, find out where they're coming from and what their goals are. <laughs> me personally, I've, I'm a West, I've been a West Coast sheltered kid. I've been like being out here, the main thing I've learned is uh, you have to sit back and look at people and figure out who they are. That's an interesting thing I've learned because, I mean, this country we live in is huge. In every state I've gone to, I've met different types of people, different types of personalities. They treat you in different ways. We never got too far south, but in Virginia, you could feel that southern hospitality. On the other hand, I've met kids from the north, northeast that were like, just rich, 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 preppy college frat boys who were had been raised on nothing but spoonfuls of money their whole life. And you can spot those kids too. A lot of them are pretty cool. But man, it's I think that's the main thing is that I I've been kind of sheltered as a West Coast kid coming out here and seeing all the different walks of life. Like it's crazy. We met at a party in Northern California um, on Valentine's Day. Um, some mutual friends. I had just traveled up there and I was going to spend a week up there. And um, we were introduced. I think I was humming Gayuti. And she took note and came over and had a lengthy discussion on how there's no West Coast fish fans, followers. Actually, so started talking about fish and I overheard him and I said, oh, are you a fish fan? And he said, yes, I am. And I just went and saw fish for New Year's in um, New York City. So we started talking about that and um, we talked for a good hour or so. And then two days later, same house, I, I played Name That Fish Tune on my guitar. I played horn and uh, she guessed it right. And we tried to spend every minute since that night together. Back and getting this time off, clean, hometown show, man, Alpine Valley, 21st birthday, midnight tonight, I am officially 21. I used to love game engines, one of the, one of the, after, uh, after Cavern, one of the first things that really got me into fish. The, the story is really, um, really about revolution going past oppression. It's all, it's all a metaphor, uh, you know, like, I mean, yeah, Wilson is the bad and everything, and it's recognizing that, and the lizards, and, you know, I mean, it's like all the knowledge is kept in the helping from the book. It's, it's just all a metaphor to, like, how, the way we live our lives and how we chase knowledge and how we chase happiness and how things intrude it, you know? The basic theme that I got out of it personally and is kind of from Nietzsche that good and evil are relative terms, and what's good for one person might be evil to another person and vice versa. It's like they overthrow Wilson and all that, but at the end of it, I mean, Forbin ends up in a prison as a, as a political prisoner, and he was, you know, one of the good guys towards the beginning of it. I mean, so. It's, it's greed versus compassion to me. Like uh, Wilson representing self-interest and self-everything, um, self and the lizards just being free and kind of also in a way ignorant, but. Ignorance is bliss. To me, it's it's a nice journey. It's a nice story. It's 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 cool to kind of get lost in it and really imagine. And I definitely have pictures of Wilson and you know pictures of the different characters and Tila. I almost got thrown out of the Atlanta show 
for uh, hopping over the hopping over the fence into the pavilion. And this big guy grabbed me, right, and he tried to throw me out. But he went to talk to one of his other security guard friends about throwing me out. While they were talking, I like jet. And I went to the bathroom and I changed my shirt and like my clothes and everything, my whole identity. And then they came on and they started playing Wilson, right? And I, I just happened to be like right behind the security guard. And I, I was like, that's Wilson. And like everybody right there started cheering at him. <laughs> uh, I'm not really familiar with the game I saw you at all. But uh, I do recall back in high school, me and a bunch of my friends, we had this friend of ours, she happened to be a female, we went to school with. And we called her multi-beast. And that was because she was pretty fucking ugly and fat. <laughs> The way I feel when I'm at a fish show and I'm and they're really into a great big hairy jam and this and that, it's just it's it's so out there, it's really hard to describe what it is. I mean, the closest thing I could describe the way I feel when I'm listening to their music and I'm watching a show is that I'm riding this great big long roller coaster that lasts between two and a half and three hours long that has like all these peaks and valleys and hills and loops and tunnels. And you never really know when it's going to end, but you don't want to get off. And when you're done riding it, you want to get right back on again. But when you get that great synergy between the professor and the students, just like when Fish is on stage and they play a great jam and the crowd gets psyched, that gets them more psyched, so the jam gets better, then the crowd gets more wild, then the band gets more excited. Just like in class, when I'm teaching an amazing point of law, like the flexibility, say, of the... Uh, patent and copyright clause of the United States Constitution, that they feed off my excitement, learn about how, wow, this really is something beautiful and creative, that the copyright law is just as exciting as a great rock and roll jam in terms of its intellectual quality. And that gets them more excited and bright-eyed and into the discussion, which makes me happier and gets me more excited. The class has very little fat and very little downtime in that we're sitting there, we're assimilating difficult concepts, applying them and analyzing them to tough factual situations and everybody walks out wondering how they got so much in three hours. A common bond between almost everybody. 16 to 75,000 people can all gather um, in one venue and they're all thriving on one sound and they're all there to hear one thing and they enjoy dancing. That's one thing I really enjoy. This is a family. This is a, this is a bunch of souls that are connected to each other on some level or another, you know? Whether or not we all remember that all the time is another story. That's something we have to work on. But uh, uh, there's definitely inherently there's, there's a, a spiritual connection that's happening here with all these kids. And that when you see a kid, no matter where you are, you're in the middle of Nebraska at a rest stop, you see a kid that looks like you, you can say like, hey, what's up, bro? And you guys start a conversation right there. And, and, and connect on the level that, that we connect on. I don't know, it's just like a bunch of people coming out and enjoying like one thing, you know, every night it's great. The whole thing reminds me of Siddhartha and there's a scene sort of towards the end where he talks about one voice and then more voices and then many voices and it all becomes the river and the river is, you know, us and the universe. And this scene is like that and you can feel that connection. You can be in the river here or you can step out of the river. Everybody's there for the same reason, Word. and like, it's the music, it's, and they're all just trying to, to get to that place where we can look around and see, see each other, like, and, and you know, it's, it's more than just seeing, though, like, you feel each other in the same place. I wanted to talk about, like, why we're here or whatever. It just clouds it because we are here, and if you just surrender to the flow and live, that's what it's all about, I think. I can't wait to get home, give my mom, dad, everybody a hug, shower, give my dog a big old hug. When I get home, first thing I'm going to do, even though no matter how tired I am, I'm just going to open up the door, take my dog, and run for miles. Everybody needs to realize that we're here for one thing, and that's to enjoy the music. You know, just love everybody, and then it'll be able to keep going on. I don't want to see it, what happened with the Grateful Dead happen to Fish. I don't want it to go out of hand. And it's going to take all of us to do that. You know, save our scene, man. You know, save, 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 save our scene, man.
great. Birthday. Let's go to Pittsburgh. I was like, what the hell? We go to Pittsburgh, seven hours away, no big deal. Play Axe as Bold as Love as the encore. Oh man, it's like one of my favorite songs. Like I listen to that when I go to sleep at night. Oh, it's so great. Happy Have a great birthday. night, man. Happy birthday. Happy Full stability first set. For like second set was a lot more mellow. Uh, good so, manga song. Got the glide. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Rock on. Chris wrote his autograph. Awesome. Nice. Dude. <laughs> it's uh, 315. Uh, that was the best show of the tour, dude. 